Today's review is sponsored by Tofu Soda, now with 50% less flavor. Watch it, Alan, I'm shooting. Don't torture a duckling. Which would you prefer, a kiss or money? I get a kick out of how many horror movies begin with the word don't. It's kind of become a made-up subgenre. I mean, it's in no ways a real subgenre, but it's fun to think of it as one, because every movie involves somebody doing what the title tells them not to do. Don't go in the house, don't look in the basement, don't go near the park, don't look now, don't answer the phone, don't go in the woods. Alone. I like to think of it as the rebellious teenager genre always doing what you tell them not to do. Don't Torture a Duckling is a giallo movie directed by one of my favorite directors, Lucio Fulci. I love me some giallo cinema. There's always room for giallo. Sorry. My friend Randy and I have been arguing over which one of us came up with that term, but I'm gonna give the credit to him. I'm still gonna say it, though. The movie takes place in an isolated Italian village where the locals are very superstitious and do not trust outsiders. Things become volatile when the town is plagued by a series of child killings. It's up to a reporter and a promiscuous young woman to find the killer before things get out of hand. You don't really expect that from the local police now, do you? She's right. We ought to do it. Lucio Fulci has always been known for his gore. When you hear Fulci, you think eye trauma, arterial spray, eye trauma, guts being ripped or puked out, and did I mention eye trauma? But he also has quite a few movies in his catalog that are not as gory as you would think. This is where Don't Torture a Duckling comes in. Giuseppe's a big baby! My son! When the giallo boom began in the 70s, thanks to Mario Bava and Dario Argento, a lot of Italian directors jumped on the craze. Fulci made five giallo movies, Lizard in a Woman's Skin, The Psychic, New York Ripper, Murder Rock, and of course the movie we're talking about today. More casual Fulci fans might be a tad disappointed in this movie. They know Fulci for his gore movies. So if you go into this expecting his bloody flair, you're going to be disappointed. That's not to say it's bad, it's a damn good flick. And it does have some bloodshed sprinkled throughout. Just don't go in expecting a typical Fulci bloodbath. <laughs> The tension in Don't Torture a Duckling comes from two things. The first is that the victims are primarily children. That's what sets it apart from most giallo films. Italian movies aren't afraid to kill off a kid, but usually in giallo movies, the victims are primarily adults. Same thing with American slasher films. A kid may be killed off here and there, but the victims are mostly horny teenagers and college students. But here, it's mostly kids getting killed off. That takes the horror up a notch. Usually in movies, a child is viewed as someone that needs to be protected. Don't Torture a Duckling takes away that safety net. It's more than just a bruise this time. It's a contusion. Yes, a violent blow by a blunt weapon. You never really see the kids get killed. You only see the aftermath. It's like the movie Seven. You see the crime scene. You see the mangled body and hear about what the victim went through. It never gets as extreme in Don't Torture a Duckling, but it's still unsettling to see these kids alive one minute and dead the next. <coughs> I'm one of those guys who thinks what you don't see can be scarier than what you do see. This movie shows you the bodies and allows your mind to fill in the blanks. 
I like when a movie allows the audience to fill in the gaps. The second source of tension comes from the villagers themselves. As I said before, they don't trust outsiders, and they're very superstitious. Once the first kid is murdered, these people want revenge, so the police have to be very careful in how they deal with the case. Once someone is branded a suspect, the villagers are out for blood. <laughs> It doesn't matter if they've been cleared of the charges, once they've been branded a suspect, the townsfolk want them dead. The movie stars Barbara Boucher and Thomas Millian. Both were prominent actors in Italian exploitation. Thomas Millian was mostly known for Policieschi, or Eurocrime. These were cop and gangster-based action movies that were big in Italy from the late 60s through the early 80s. <laughs> Millian is one of my favorite Italian actors. He always plays these larger-than-life characters. He can play a badass protagonist, an evil son of a bitch, or an absolute weasel. Hey, what's your name, man? Theodore. Ah, Theodore, son of a whore, good to know ya. He does a good job in this movie, but he's not given a lot to do. I like it when Millian is able to play these over-the-top characters. Here, he's just your basic giallo protagonist. It's still a good performance, it's just not what you usually get from Thomas Millian. Cigarette? No. They're free. No, no. Go on. Then there's Barbara Boucher playing Patrizia. Her character is made to both arouse you and make you uneasy. Her intentions are kept ambiguous. She has a few encounters with some of the kids who end up dead, and during those interactions, you can't tell if she's being playful or sinister. It's all right. <laughs> That's it. Come on. We're going to buy you a nice new doll. There's a scene very early on in the film that's usually meant to titillate the audience, but the way Fulci handles it, it kind of creeps you out and it's supposed to. Patrizia is laying naked in her bedroom when a little boy brings her juice, but instead of covering herself up, she starts flirting with the kid. Would you like to go to bed with me? I said, would you like to go to bed with me? Yeah. <laughs> I bet you would. Thankfully, it never goes any further than that, but it still makes you uncomfortable. And that pretty much defines her character. She's constantly turning you on and turning you off at the same time. And you question if she's some kind of nut job. I gotta mention the setting real quick, then we'll move on to the Grindhouse rankings. Everything from the village to the green hillsides look gorgeous. <laughs> I don't own this movie on Blu-ray yet, but even on DVD, it looks beautiful. I gotta get the Blu-ray, because I know it'll look even better. But anyway, time for the Grindhouse rankings. We've got a body count of six. Most of the kills are off-screen deaths, with a view of the body later. They're still effective, though, and we do get two gory on-screen kills. I won't spoil them here. It meets the giallo requirements with two gruesome on-screen deaths and its pretty scenery mixed with macabre imagery. It is missing a lot of the usual giallo traits, but that's actually a good thing. It helps the movie stand out amongst other giallo movies. The nudity is high with one uncomfortable nude scene. The setting is absolutely beautiful. We get good tension and atmosphere. The ending is good, but the movie does end kind of abruptly. It could have used an extra five minutes to wrap everything up but it does still give us a good final image. I'll give this a 4.5 out of 5. It's a very good giallo movie. Not my favorite by Fulci, but still good. I think it's a good introduction to people just getting into giallo movies. And yes, I know, I give a lot of 4 point something ratings, but what can I say? I like talking about movies that I like. But don't worry, we'll be getting into some lower ratings soon. As always, I want to thank all of you for watching and supporting my channel. If you're new here, please subscribe and give this video a thumbs up if you like what I do here, or give it a thumbs down if you don't like what I do here. Leave a comment down below. This is the most important question you will ever answer in your life. Donald Duck or Daffy Duck? Pick a side, people. This is the Maniac, here to remind you that the Grindhouse will never die. Pick a side.